All right. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? I want to see some emojis flying up from the bottom right of my screen if everybody's excited. There we go. Seeing a couple here. All right. So today, I hope you're all excited for day three of Cask on Evoke. We have another great day of events ready for you today. And uh, we're actually starting off today with an excellent keynote speaker. And um, I'm going to introduce him right now. His name is Ashkan Carbus Frushin. So over the past 20 years, Ashcan has developed, has helped build two of the most successful content brands in the consumer web industry. First Ask Men and now Watch Mojo, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. As a seasoned writer, Ash has authored over a thousand articles on subjects including management, business, relationship, sports, history, pop culture, and entertainment, and has interviewed hundreds of newsmakers and celebrities. Following News Corp and IGN's acquisition of Ask Men, Ash founded Watch Mojo and helped it turn into one of the most successful media brands ever built on YouTube, surpassing deeper funded competitors who futilely burn through tens of millions of venture capital. Today, Watch Mojo remains one of the 25 largest YouTube channels of all time. Serving as the chief executive officer and the editor in chief, Ash's vision and execution translated into a pop culture phenomenon that commands an audience of over 30 million subscribers and 150 million unique monthly viewers who spend 2 billion minutes watching over 300 million videos each month. It's a lot of stats right there. All time, Watch Mojo's passionate audience have viewed 15 billion videos and have spent 80 billion minutes on the channel. In 2015, Ernst & Young recognized the company's success by awarding Ash the top award in the media and entertainment category. Very impressive. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to announce our keynote for today, Ash Ken Carbis Fruition. Take it away, Ash. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, some of those stats need to be updated. Uh, and I forgot you were going to say all that. So uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about the paradox of entrepreneurship uh, by discussing a little bit my journey uh, at Watch Mojo when we sought out to inform and entertain audiences with a video on every topic. Um, so uh, just a little bit, just in case it wasn't in the background, uh, just a few points. So I was actually born in 1978 uh, in Iran and then moved to Spain for a year and then basically settled in Montreal in Canada at the age of six. So I basically grew up here, um, but always had a multi-global view, which if you're going to work on the internet uh, is really helpful. Um, but I wasn't always you know, thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, let alone working in media. I graduated in finance from the John Molson School of Business. And, you know, I actually wanted to do investment banking or consulting. Why? Don't know. It's kind of like when you study something, sometimes you think there's a certain career path. And the reason why I mention that is because it's important to sometimes recognize that you may study something and it's a kind of tool in your toolbox. But if you're passionate about other things or if you have a comparative advantage in another area you want to make sure that you're aware of all the opportunities so through a lot of externalities largely the nasdaq blowing up in 2000 the dot-com market crashing 9 11 i didn't pursue a career in finance and i landed in digital media i worked at mama which was a search engine when you know with some success when google was in beta then i moved to ask men that's where i realized i was really more of a, st a storyteller and then eventually I, I developed the, I caught the entrepreneurial bug and I launched Watch Mojo. So I'm married to my co-founder, um, which is a bit weird. It's very rare. And we have two daughters, 13 and 11. Watch Mojo has been profitable since 2012. And not just my wife and I, the same five co-founders remain some 17 years later, which is definitely rare. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, I've been, you know, very active writing. It really helps, I think, uh, to stay sane. People need an outlet, whether it's playing sports, working out, cooking, traveling, or whatever. Um, and in the last couple of years, I've also invested in about 30 companies through Granicus Group, which is like a family office or uh, investment vehicle. And you're welcome to follow me on Twitter for more irreverent takes or LinkedIn for quasi more serious uh, perspectives. So today, I really kind of am breaking down this discussion in three buckets. The first one is really just overall company success and kind of like some of the things you need in between the ears to succeed as a leader, as an entrepreneur, as a teammate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about like kind of like Watch Mojo, but really a lot more like behavioral, psychological things you need to uh, master and be aware of. 
Then I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, finding your personal professional product market fit, what I call finding your course to success. Um, and then finally, I'm going to give just some kind of personal anecdotes, uh, as I like to say, how to be successful and stay sane. So briefly, uh, not to give a history lesson, but when it comes to the online video space, uh, you know, it's been, you know, from the onset of the World Wide Web, I think the promise and the future was always, can we basically take what happens with TV and move it and make it more personal uh, online? And so when I started Watch Mojo, we were kind of already in this third wave of the distribution platforms. And YouTube was one of the many belligerents. And YouTube ended up prevailing. Um, and I've discussed that for many reasons. And, you know, I think at a, in a nutshell, they were just frankly more comfortable around piracy, uh, to be candid. And then when YouTube bought them, they had the right backer in terms of legal sales technology to really uh, stand out. And so if you fast forward to today, we're really talking more about just 247 connectivity. And, um, you know, YouTube is the dominant player in the AVOD, advertising video on demand landscape, with Netflix being the leader in the subscription side. Um, and what you're seeing is this kind of like, kind of what I call the empire strikes back now on the content side, which is rights holders recognizing that, you know, the, the web is the future, it's the present, and they have to be active. But when we launched Watch Mojo, as any self-respecting um, self self-respecting entrepreneur would, would think, we were late. I thought, oh my God, this revolution has started, um, you know, we'll just be a footnote in this kind of chapter of history of media. But realistically, you know, we were in the third wave, but we were still pretty early and we we're very lucky. Uh, luck plays a big part and timing plays a big part that we were concurrent with YouTube. And so, you know, where we are now, I would say if I had to update this deck, I would say you're probably seeing front and center of the creator economy, um, which we could discuss on, on another day. But I would say um, we, this, this opportunity has kind of come full circle where traditional rights holders now um, don't view the web as an afterthought. Look at Disney Plus and how aggressively they've expanded and COVID accelerated that. But this does speak a little bit about, you know, it's not just enough to have a good vision and a good strategy. Timing matters. And we were definitely very uh, fortunate to be contemporary with YouTube. Um, and as I was saying, when we launched in 2006, this was a kind of visual that I would kind of convey saying, you had Hollywood at the top of the pyramid, but they were not going to embrace the web. So that created a vacuum and an opportunity. And whereas today, the creator economy, influencers and individual storytellers definitely are, are a powerful force. In the mid 2000s, it wasn't necessarily what marketers wanted. So the opportunity that I spotted was in between all that was to kind of tell the same stories about planets and cooking recipes and travel destinations, as well as pop culture franchises but in a format that was just more natural for younger audiences online. Um, if you, you know, we discussed a little bit why YouTube won. This is from a, a keynote I gave at VidCon a couple of years ago. I could happily share this deck and, you know, it's got a lot of you know, anecdotal and factual reasons as to why YouTube won. Um, and, and frankly, for me as an entrepreneur, when we started, you know, as a, as a viewer, as a consumer myself, I was spending a, a lot of time on YouTube but it took a few, um, it took a while for me to really uh, say, we got to go all in on YouTube. And I'm going to discuss some of the reasons uh, why later on. But ultimately, I would say we ourselves, you know, kind of pivoted. We didn't really pivot on the one hand because we were always a content producer. We were always, you know, kind of telling stories. But it would be disingenuous to say that the same strategy that I started with in 2006 is the strategy that led to our ultimate success. I would say sometime in 2012, I was sitting, in that park, Madison Square Park in New York after being rejected by a, the hundredth investor. And they wanted to invest in us so long as we would pivot into fashion and style and beauty because it was a vertical that the investor really wanted to, uh, it was Bo Peabody, who was actually the founder of Tripod years ago in the first, uh, in the dot-com era. So, you know, very smart guy, great guy. He also talks a lot about the importance of luck. Um, and all to say, he really wanted to invest, but he was like, there's an opening in the style, beauty, fashion. And I said, I understand why you think I should be in that vertical. But I was like, my heart's not in it. But that day, as I sat there with one of my uh, advisors and friends, I knew that I needed to change. And to quote Michael Milken, the best investor is a social scientist. So we kind of made four big bets. 
the first one was that I recognized that geek culture would become pop culture. What I mean by that is kids who grew up reading comic books were now decision makers on Madison Avenue, Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and Wall Street. And what that meant was all of a sudden, Batman would be on the box of Wheaties. And it wouldn't just be movies about Spider-Man, but you would have movies on Ant-Man. And recognizing that, I just felt that we should probably, instead of necessarily trying to develop our own IP, which is really expensive and risky and something that I was passionate about, but as a, as a realistic person, I just felt that, you know, we've been covering this universe of fandom and it's really what was driving a lot more engagement. If you're looking for a fondue recipe, you search in and out, you recognize what ingredient you're missing or you realize you're heating it too high or too low, but there's not that much connection with that publisher. But if you are a fan of Star Wars or Star Trek, you were spending hours consuming our content. And as an entrepreneur, you kind of realize, hey, you're here to serve. You have many stakeholders to please, but ultimately that's a signal and you have to be uh, aware of it. The second one was that, you know, we felt that free, a fair use was a freedom of expression and, and the freedom of the press. And because we had relationships with rights holders, it was kind of logical for us to then start to feature some of the clips in the videos, uh, which made our content really stand out. In, in 2010, if you went on YouTube and you searched for Beyonce, there was probably somebody on a couch telling you why he or she loved Beyonce. Whereas our videos, you're actually seeing uh, commentary around Beyonce's music and music videos, and that made us stand out. It also admittedly put a bit of a bullseye on our back, but you know I was comfortable with legal uh, topics and debating, and through just common sense, logic, and diplomacy, uh, we managed to turn all those rights holders into our allies and partners. The third one, we were doing everything. You know, we were doing Q and A's and how tos and lists. And at the time, not that many people were doing lists. And even though I've written books and I loved essays and video essays, you have to kind of set your ego aside and say, look, it's a short attention universe, a short attention span universe. People will watch a top 10 Seinfeld scenes, but they may not watch long essays, deep dives into a given topic. So it just made sense for us to embrace that. And as I say, Wayne's World, Letterman and Moses, the OG of lists and his 10 commandments, mankind's always been drawn to that format. And really the fourth one was the big one was we recognized the power and the promise of YouTube. A lot of media companies viewed YouTube as a bit of a frenemy and YouTube went from being the pariah to the bell of the ball. And I realized as a storyteller entrepreneur, you know, I wanted to go where the audience was. Now, switching gears a little bit, if I had to give you guys a condensed version of some of the lessons that frankly, as an employer, an employer, as a teammate, as an entrepreneur, as an intrapreneur, as an executive, either way, these are some things that could apply to your course to success. One, the best ideas come from anywhere. Um, whenever I hear younger audiences talk about the workforce, their mental health, a lot of my peers, they roll their eyes and they're like, the next generation doesn't get it. I'm like, that's kind of nonsense because the next generation was the generation that said civil rights, um, you know, there needed to be a revolution there. Um, views about the LGBT community. There's so many things that the next generation has championed. So for me, I actually have had a lot of success by listening to everybody, understanding that the 20 year old intern can have a good idea or the 60 year old that you think is clueless, you know, they may actually have a good perspective. And there's a quote by Steve Jobs, uh, that goes, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do, end quote. So that is pretty much, you know, uh, out of my playbook. Um, Watch Mojo remains a pretty flat organization. Obviously, the people that I built the company with, like that's my team, that's my posse. And then they obviously have hired people and I let them manage the rest. I'm there to support them. But I always try to tell them that, like, you got to leave your ego at the door uh, because the best idea coming from your, you know, your door, your inbox um, you know, may not be the people that you think have the best ideas. And, and in our universe covering fandom, that's kind of on steroids because you want kids to come to you and tell you what the next big hits are. You know, if you could basically be, if you want to be a curator and a tastemaker, you have to be the one that introduces Squid Game to the world. You don't want people to be huge fans of Game of Thrones and then you kind of try to jump on that rocket ship. Um, the other one is more regarding sales and traction. You know, I got rejected by a lot of VCs for many reasons, some valid, some less, but ultimately fair reasons. But one of them was always content doesn't scale. 
And what I would, what I learned over time, is patience and persistence is really key because things that scale overnight are not necessarily sustainable, and things that are sustainable take a lot of time to scale. And in fact, in 20 years of working in industry, and frankly, 30 years of studying uh, successful and less successful businesses, everything will take longer and cost more. And frankly, revenues will always start to take off later and not as quickly as you thought, whereas your costs are gonna hit you in the face right away. So as you kind of plan your you know, world domination, uh, just take that into account and be somewhat realistic with your forecast because that is definitely something that investors will use against you if you're you know, not being realistic. Um, the, the next point is a bit more, you know, today you read a lot about conscious capitalism, progressive capitalism, servant leadership. And I, I not only believe in all that, 15, 20 years ago when I was writing for TechCrunch, that was my jam. I would basically tell people that like, you have to understand psychology, you have to understand sociology, you have to understand history if you're going to succeed um, because you're ultimately more of a coach than a boss. Um, you're, you're really more a teammate and you have to understand why somebody is not performing it may have to do with trauma that they experienced five years ago. It could be if they had a rough weekend. And I know it's verboten in, in HR to go up to somebody and be like, hey, what happened to you in high school or college or in your first job that you now are not meeting your potential? Uh, we, we tend to separate that personal baggage from professional success. But the same way that 15 years ago I talked about, you know, servant leadership um, and and you know, today it's kind of common thinking. Similarly, one reason why I was able to retain my team for so long and, and have a good culture was because I actually always asked, okay, so this is the decision, how will the person affected feel? And we have a lot of those questions. We'll spend five, 10 minutes sometimes discussing how people will feel through a certain decision. And that explains how then we have to communicate and people talk about culture. But if you don't care about people's feelings, empathy, and you literally put yourself in their shoes and you literally say, well, how do we have to communicate this? Because culture is just a, is a function of your communication. Then you can't really have a positive culture. Um, but to that end, I also kind of, you know, I'm 43 now. I started the business when I was 27. And, you know, I always go, it's bringing on the heartbreak. It's one heartbreak, one disappointment for another. And some of that is you do have to set your own expectations. People will not share your values or principles. I think entrepreneurs, by and large, are masochists, executives who are reaching the top of their trade tend to be sadists. Um, not passing judgment, you need both of those traits to run a successful organization. But I learned that I was always setting myself up to get disappointed because I would always assume that people would be good and people would be super honest and people would be long-term greedy wanting to create value. But I realized, no, people are a lot more near-term greedy. People are a lot more me, me, me. And that ultimately, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the difference between entrepreneurs and, and a lot of others. And, and one reason for that goes back to, we are all driven by insecurities. There's good insecurities and bad insecurities. And we're all balancing basically sins and virtues, whether it's greed or fear um, and whatnot. And I'll touch a little bit about all that. And I think those are actual intangibles that if you really, really want to be successful, um, if you want to know why Watch Mojo took a $200,000 investment and probably built the greatest ROI from any investment in the history of media compared to all of our peers who spent tens, 30, 50, $100 million in VC is because they didn't believe this stuff. They thought this was mumbo jumbo, but this is really the, the secret sauce. Finally, but not finally, there's a lot more. There are no sacred cows. You cannot get attached to anything, any project or anyone. I built a business where whenever I had companies wanting to buy Watch Mojo, they would come and they would say, Ash, let's talk about bus insurance. I'm like, what, what insurance? They're like, what happens if Ash gets hit by a bus? I was like, spend a bit more time with us and you'll see why I'm actually, sure, false modesty aside, I add some intangibles. There's an element, there is an X factor whenever an entrepreneur is not around, but I'm like, you'll see the company pretty much could run without me. Um, and that's really entrepreneurship. You don't want to set up a company where if you're out of the mix, the company falls apart. That's you know just basically not, that's the opposite of entrepreneurship. But I also set a company where as much as I hate to lose any member of my team, I fundamentally have built a culture and a system where the, the company should get better. It should actually use that opportunity to find efficiencies and say, hey, maybe before we didn't want to do something because we didn't 
think the person would feel well about it. So we kind of took less profit because we focused on people. But now we actually have a clean slate. And I know that is a bit jarring and, and it's, you know, a lot of HR people will say you can't say that. But I think that is the definition of a well-functioning uh, company. When I left AskMen, AskMen went on to do better for a while. And then you could argue that the new parent didn't invest, which was a shame. But you want to have a culture where both the organization could be better after somebody leaves because it creates an opportunity for new ideas and new energy. But I, you also want to manage and build up individuals who, once they leave, should, in theory, go on to uh, greener pastures very idealistic. Ultimately, it's up to the individuals to deliver on that, but there are no sacred cows. So later on, I'm going to say, uh, I have a slide that goes, it's all about you more or less, but I want to preface that by saying it's actually not about you. Throughout my career, I would always internalize things. I was very hard on myself. So if something went well, I was always quick to give credit to the team because it doesn't cost you anything and it creates a better culture. But whenever something would go wrong or whenever I would just see something, I always thought, oh my God, what did I do? What did I say? Am I getting fired? Am I going to lose this client? Am I going to you know, turn off this investor? But the reality is people have their own challenges. People have their own demons. They're struggling with things. There's things with their spouse, with their kids. And when bad things happen or things that don't go according to plan, it's very easy for you as a leader, as a teammate to internalize it you know, and think they're out to get you and there's this whole conspiracy. More often than not, I swear to you, that's not the case. Again, why? Insecurities, sins and virtues. People are, are going through a lot. I think now this period of mental health and all that, which I've been writing about for 15, 20 years, I think it's become more commonplace. But the sooner you realize um, you, you attempt to remove, you need a lot of emotion. You know, you do need a lot of passion to succeed. You know, you don't want to be vegetable lasagna out there. But the sooner you remove some of that like sensitivity, which I struggle with personally and, and are not emotional about things, you gain this clarity to just make better decisions and to really, really lead, um, you know, with less of that kind of X factor that may not necessarily be constructive. And frankly, which a lot of your, your, your troops and your soldiers may not even necessarily understand. Is there a recipe for success? So way back, I guess that was 2012 when I was still writing for TechCrunch, uh, Facebook was doing their IPO and they said, look, do you want to write something about Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook? I said, sure, let me just come up with like a, an ingredient for success. And at the time I basically said, it's ambition. Uh, I'm sorry, but you, you know, it's so hard to succeed and it's so lonely even when you succeed that you do need ambition. You, you, if you don't have that ambition, you're just, people are going to eat your lunch. The second one is you need some kind of vision. Now, you may not have a full view of what you need to do when you start, but you do need to have a POV. You need to have a point of view, a perspective, a hypothesis, and you got to be open to adjust that and tweak that. And yes, you want to be rigid on vision and loose on, on execution, but you also need to realize sometimes you're driving this way and you just need to adjust a little bit. Um, third, execution. So clearly ideas, Ideas are not worthless. Ideas are actually super valuable, but if you don't execute them, then the idea was kind of you know, a waste of time. The most important one is persistence, and I'll touch on persistence in the next slide. The fifth and sixth one that I think are also super critical and they're intangible, a lot of people discount, are luck and timing. Um, I added after I published this article, so we didn't really have success like rocket ship success, product market fit success until 2013 onwards. So maybe subconsciously, I used to have people tell me I should focus. And again, we're all driven by insecurities and we're all struggling in our own way. I almost militantly did not include focus in 2012 because I was like, no, no, no. If I focus now, I may focus on the wrong thing. But years later, when I kind of looked at this list, I did have focus when you know what to focus on, when you find that product market fit or in the world of storytelling, that platform format fit. You know, how Watch Mojo ultimately lists with clips from entertainment franchises with commentary and voiceover. And that kind of was a lightning in a bottle. And then frankly, after COVID, I did add resilience because frankly, uh, persistence is everything, but if you're not resilient, you're going to die. So this is one of my favorite quotes in like 20 years. It's Calvin Coolidge, former president of the U.S. Quote, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent or people with talent. 
genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination or tenacity alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race, end quote. So accurate, I won't say anything else. Um, now moving on, I want to talk a little bit about finding your own sweet spot. What I like to say, the, the, the title of my first book was Course to Success, Everything You Need to Succeed Beyond School. Um, and so that's kind of what I, my way of discussing, you know, the whole product market fit. It's not just about a company and an actual product. You are a product. You're selling yourself. It's also about yourself. So I, I touched on vision and you see here, I talk about vision with a capital V versus vision with a lowercase V. What is the difference? So vision with a capital V is like that big thesis, right? So vision compared to mission, by the way, is the why it's like, what doesn't change? For us, our statement of purpose is here to serve. You could argue our vision is here to serve, but our vision really was to inform and entertain. I'm a storyteller. I didn't read a lot of books, but I read a lot of encyclopedias. I read a lot of magazines. I'm a sponge. I knew more facts than any sane, healthy person needed to know. It's not a coincidence that that all channeled and funneled into Watch Mojo. So the vision with the capital V really was, hey, the world is moving towards the web. Storytelling is moving towards video. There's this revolution where mobile devices are going to put a TV, a radio, uh, everything in your pocket. And sociologically, attention spans are gonna be shorter. The world is gonna be global. Kids are not gonna watch through an hour long documentary on Alexander the Great, which is a topic of my second book. But you know what? A five minute bio on Alexander the Great, a seven minute video on Alexander the Great's journey, and two minute video on why Alexander the Great, after he died, the Greek empire fell apart, they will watch through that. And every website and every web page will have a video on it or will at least click to a video and we wanna have a video on every topic. That was the big vision. Lowercase vision is really, do you have all the visibility? Do you have the view? Do you have the facts? I wish, I wouldn't change anything, I love where I am, but to say I wouldn't do things differently is psychotic. Of course, I would do certain things differently. I probably could have early on taken a bit more time to scour the landscape. I definitely did way too much, definitely did way too fast, which you could argue in hindsight paid off. But definitely, I think sometimes you just should pause and take in a little bit more of the landscape. Very importantly, Plato, comparative advantage, principle of specialization. There is something that you do better than 99% of the world. Don't ignore that. Why? Because you're going to be passionate about that. You're going to be able to stay in the arena longer than others, stay in the trenches and outlast others. Going back to education, you might have a finance degree, but that doesn't mean you need to work in finance. If your passion is stamps and you are the greatest stamp collector of all times, you may want to take your financial training and pursue a career in stamps, for example. Not the best analogy. The other one is just don't be a sheep. You don't want to be doing things because other people are doing it. If right now you're an emerging entrepreneur, you're a coder, you're an investor, and you see everybody's in NFTs, okay, maybe you need to be in there. Maybe you want to be in that space, but you don't have to because everything takes three to five years before it succeeds. So to quote Warren Buffett, you got to resist the institutional imperative. My third book, The Tenure Overnight Success, An Entrepreneur's Manifesto, tells the story of Watch Mojo and YouTube and all that. And it's a tenure overnight success for a reason, right? So you don't want to necessarily just follow the latest fad because you're just never going to do anything. I'm Canadian. By law, I must reference Wayne Gretzky once a time. A lot of VCs talk about this quote to the point that it's annoying. Fred Wilson, one of the greatest investors of all time. Uh, you know, we used to compare notes 15 years ago when I went to his office. First thing I saw, I go, you have Wayne Gretzky on your card. He had this quote on his card, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. It's a cliche, but it's very true. You really, really want to kind of plan out vision where the market's going to be in two to three years, possibly five years. And as long as 10 years. And if that scares you because you're going into entrepreneurship for the quick overnight success, you're in the wrong lane. Fish where the fish are. We went to YouTube. Again, one of the reasons we succeeded was because Viacom didn't put VH1 on YouTube. So we took a lot of lists that were probably covered by a VH1. Kids were on YouTube. We served that need. 
with, before moving to the next section, when I was in finance, somebody once said, you're, you're a great sales guy. And I was almost offended. I was like, me? Sales? No, man, I'm finance. But that's like nonsense. We're all in sales. We're selling ourselves. We're selling a product. We're selling a feeling. We're selling a, a tangible or an intangible. To go back to Steve Jobs, the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. Learn how to tell stories. However that is, visuals, graphs, picture, concept on a napkin, article, you have to. Switching gears, how to be successful and not lose your mind. So balance, uh, uh, last year, uh, a conference organizer asked me to come and talk about balance. And when I mentioned that to my daughters, who are, are 13 and 11 now, they laughed and <laughs> they cracked up. They're like, daddy, you balance? But I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Balance is a journey to a destination you never arrive to. It's a process. Balance is not getting hurt or getting into an accident and just being like, life is good, kumbaya. It's okay to yell and be upset and let your emotions out. But then you gotta process that and get to a point where you don't show up to work and yell at your colleagues. Last night, um, I was cooking. I love to cook. I burned the chicken. I yelled. And I was much happier yelling at the chicken and moving on than like taking it out on my kids, which you should never do, right? So balance is admittedly not something, like if you watch Seinfeld, I know I'm dating myself, where like serenity now. It's, it's actually being open about the hurt, the disappointment, the pain, the sadness, when people let you down, when your dreams don't go, you know, your dreams are shattered, et cetera when people rip you off, when people steal from you. It's okay to have those emotions, but what do you do with it? You do need a release. So contractually, legally, morally, I am almost obligated in every speech I make now, every phone call to mention that you do gain perspective as you get older. So uh, a month ago or 45 days ago, I had a wonderful opportunity to go and represent Canada. Uh, I've been playing soccer for 20 years, I would say, this might be my insecurity and or my uh, sins or virtues, maybe pride, borderline hubris. I would say at my peak, I was probably a better soccer player and striker than I was an entrepreneur. Um, but it was always like a side thing. It was always a release. So a month and a half ago, I had the opportunity to go and represent Canada playing soccer at a tournament. It was great. I went. Um, the, you could watch the video if you'd like. On the first game, I stole the ball, ran down the pitch, had a couple of defenders I was evading. I shot the ball really hard. I scored. Great, very short-lived euphoria turned into a lot of frustration where I got injured. I was very lucky for 20 years not to get injured despite playing, but I tore my ACL, which sucks. And that's like a serious injury. But in many ways, and I don't want to be toxic positivity guy, but it is all about perspective because in the grand scheme of things, that's an injury that you can cope with, you can manage, you can overcome. But I did learn a lot of lessons and I'm gonna share them with you. So one, perspective. When you're an entrepreneur, at your core, you're not content. That doesn't mean you're not happy. You're generally a positive person. You generally see the glasses half full. You're paranoid as you know what, but you are actually an optimist. If you're not an optimist, you're not gonna go through that journey. But realistically, a lot of things bother you. And as you get older, you realize that most of the things that bother you don't really merit the aggravation. There is nothing like the humility, next one, of let's say now with physio and rehab, and I can walk now fine, but for the first couple of weeks when you're walking around with a cane, I would walk to a gym where for a decade I would be playing futsal, indoor soccer, prolific score, full ability of all my means, and I look at that door, and you don't go in that door, you go in the next door, the pool, just to exercise, just to learn to walk again. And so, one thing I learned was it's okay to ask for help. All my life, I never bother anybody. Constantly, I want to help others. I want to take away their pain. I want to make sure they're happier. But I was always holding back from asking for help. It is so emancipating as a feeling to actually say, hey, I need help with stuff. And so as an entrepreneur, that is also why there is such a heavy burden on oneself because you're constantly trying to create value and you're constantly trying to recruit people and basically win people over. Turn the critic and the naysayers from saying, hey, good luck with that business, pal, to I always believed in you, buddy. 
And frankly, a lot of success starts by asking for help, understanding that you can do it all, delegating, sharing control, trusting people, letting go, knowing also that, hey, if they mess up, live and learn, it's all good. Third, you actually have to be a bit more selfish. I was constantly, and I know some of you don't know me, it's, just, it's like, who's this crazy person? One of my insecurities as an Iranian, as much as I'm atheist, as an Iranian, Muslim, Canadian, who wanted to work in media and finance post 9-11, was you did basically have a number of doors shut. Um, you didn't even know where the doors were, frankly, let alone that they would be slammed in your face. And so I always had this desire to prove myself, and that means helping. That means creating value for people before getting value back. And constantly, no matter how bigger and more successful Watch Mojo was, I was still in that mindset. And so I was doing too much, and I was basically proverbially burning the candle at both ends. So realistically, and I know people may not believe this, I've never been in as good of a mental health since my injury because I kind of acknowledge that, you know what, if you're not taking care of yourself and if you're not trying to heal yourself and basically go to bed in a good state of mind, sleep well, wake up, feed yourself well, drink the water, if mentally and physically you're not in a good shape, you're not going to help anybody. Forget trying to save the world. You're going to be a negative influence around others. And because forever I was always trying to be positive, that meant bottling a lot of things inside. So it's actually a bit okay to be selfish and focus more on yourself than trying to you know, save the whale, so to speak. Priorities. Your time is your most valuable resource. It goes by so fast. I remember my daughters being born. The company was struggling. I did a good job of always making sure we always paid everybody on time. We never missed out payments. But one time I had an $18 charge for groceries get rejected when my second daughter was born. And that's when I said, this is not any way to live. I got to change, right? But so it's not just money and resources. It is really time. Things go really fast. And if you don't respect your time and if you don't learn to say no, and if you don't learn to push back sometimes, then you can't possibly expect others to respect you, right? So you've heard that in other ways as well. It applies uh, to business. If you don't value yourself, it's hard to expect others to value you. And then frankly, gratitude. I've again been personally very, very happy. I'm always reminding people gratitude over expectations. But again, this injury, which in the grand scheme of things compared to God forbid, neurological, cardiovascular, Orthopedic is, is the one you want to, is the door you want to open. Um, but I always told people, even before my injury, don't wait for something bad to happen to appreciate how good you have it. Way, way back, I can't find it, but I'm pretty sure I wrote it in an article on Media Post or TechCrunch that I said, as an entrepreneur, you have to stay quite zen. Because if you wake up to good news, don't let it get to your head because there's a good chance statistically that you're going to get some bad news and then you're going to really miss being in that first state of mind. But also, if you wake up to bad news, hopefully there's good news to come, but you may get worse news in the day later on. So then you're going to be like, man, I wish I was back in that earlier state of mind where I was worrying about whatever. So don't be so rushed. Pace yourself. Stop the smell of roses, the sunrise. Watch the sunrise and sunset. And don't go 100 miles doing 100 things in a while. That doesn't help anybody. Then finally, um, and then we could switch gears to Q&A. I'm really quoting Steve Jobs a lot. Um, coincidence or not, I don't know. So success is fluid, subjective, and relative. It is normal. There's that great Muhammad Ali quote, like a man, a person who has the same views at 40 that he or she did at, that they did at 20, has wasted 20 years of their life. Similarly with success, what I define as success as a starry-eyed 21-year-old with big bushy hair, uh, before I started Watch Mojo, um, very different than what I view success today. And unfortunately, it's normal because we have some insecurities and some good ones are, I want to have a great legacy and help the world. Less good ones are like, hmm, my neighbor has a nicer car. I want that car, but it's to each their own. But success is, is naturally subjective. We benchmark ourselves to our peers that we went to college with. If you're two VPs at a company, it's normal to kind of look at the other person. To some extent, that's normal, even healthy, but be careful about that because that's a downward cycle. And, and it's relative and it changes over time. So this quote, which I will leave you with is, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. 
Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinion drown out your inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become, end quote. That's it. That is basically the presentation. All right, if there are any questions. All right, thank you very much, Ash. That was incredible. Um, I guess we'll start with questions. We'll start looking at the chat here. So we do have one from Krishna, and that is, any thoughts on how to work on deep, impactful vision, especially early uh, in someone's career path, say grad students or people who are just coming out of university? Sure. Great question, Krishna. So if, if by deep, impactful vision, you're referring things like beyond money, uh, kind of giving back, you know, corporate personal responsibility, um, the whole servant leadership and, and all that, then yeah, I would say two things. Not everybody um, is an entrepreneur out of the gates, so it's perfectly fine to go work for others. And it's perfectly fine to never be even an entrepreneur. So I think we live in a wonderful time where if you are driven by deep, impactful, kind of giving back kind of visions or missions, you should ask the people you are interviewing at companies who are really in a tight fight for labor, you should ask them what their raison d'etre is for one. So I think one is to just have that communication if you're going to go there. But two, for yourself, don't wait for others. I also said others may not share your moral compass. Think of that last quote that I shared with Steve Jobs. Just block out the noise. Block out the noise. Don't think of Instagram. Don't think of LinkedIn. If you were like on a remote island somehow, where if it wasn't about what your neighbor, what your spouse, what your parents think, write down what is important to you. And then it becomes clearer to support that. And I think that's really the only way. The things, the reason, the number one reason why I started a company in 2006 or 2005 and launched it in 2006 was because I knew that I couldn't find any other place that would share my principles and morals. Not nobody's perfect, we're all flawed. And so I wanted to test out and see if I could launch an organization that could kind of put people ahead of profit, that could actually care about how they felt. And I like to think largely I pulled it off. Um, and for me, it meant entrepreneurship was a means to living that end. Okay, awesome. Um, got another question here from Joe. And just a reminder, everybody, if you have any questions, go ahead and post it in the chat. We will get to them. So Joe asks, do you have any thoughts on how to make it easier for others around you to ask for help? Sure. So your question, make sure I read it right, is you're saying make it easier for others to ask for help. Great. So I don't lose sight of my unique position and uh, privilege because we all work hard. We all have challenges. But like as an entrepreneur who is still, you know, controlling shareholder, founder, CEO, et cetera, et cetera, I don't run the company by rank. If you walk in, you don't really know who's like the decision maker until eventually I'm like, okay, I heard all the points of views. How about this decision? You know, but I have this privilege where I could say, hey, sorry, I didn't know about that. Or I was wrong. Hey, upon further consideration, let's do something else. Or, hey, I was going to get to this. I just don't have time. I could make time, but it's going to come at the detriment of something else. Could you help me? I get it that by doing that, I'm almost turning on. It's like a positive signal to my colleagues because it shows I trust them. I'm sharing power. If you are an executive, if you're a junior employee, I understand that those behavior traits of mine could be seen as weakness, could be seen as he or she can't cut it. So my point is, Muez or Ahmed, um, if you are the founder, the entrepreneur, it's really easy. By demonstrating historically viewed signs of weakness, you're actually empowering your team. You're signaling to them that you're not a control freak. So that's really easy and do that from day one. But assuming 
you are like 99% of people who are not the founder, who are not like, they don't have that control. I think it goes back to recognizing people's strengths. If you say, hey, Shelly, I couldn't up a notice, but you're really good with numbers. Do you mind looking at this? I realize it might take you a while, so focus on this section, help them help you. Do you mind taking a look at this and letting me know if the numbers pass the sniff test? Again, you recognize Shelly's comparative advantage. You're paying respect to her skill set. You're conceding that she is better at you at something. You're being gracious by saying, I want you to help me make this better. But ideally, you also share the credit if you present it and, and it's you know, a, a success. So in a short answer, you want to identify people's strength and be reasonable in your ask. And then I think people generally would react pretty well to that. Yeah, for sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's uh, very good advice for anybody that um, is in a position of, uh, of, of power or, or uh, managing role within their company. Um, that sounds great. Uh from Moise, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, most entrepreneurs that I come across usually define success of the startup by the extent slash amount of external investments secured. Any comments on this perspective? So, you know, 50, 100 years ago, entrepreneurs were the misfits, the outsiders. They were people that did not fit in a given role and they were driven by certain insecurities and certain things and they would launch businesses. Richard Branson, uh, being one example, but many others. And then I think that has changed. Today, a lot of kids grow up looking at Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and they want to be entrepreneurs. And I think there's a difference between entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, and I even call ventrepreneurs. If you raise money, the second you raise money, you're still an entrepreneur. Please don't take this out of context. But immediately, your stakeholder kind of priority of needs and responsibilities change. So... Unfortunately, in the last decade, we have seen this probably not well advised emphasis on funding. But ultimately, when you raise funding, even if it's an equity investment, it's a liability. It's basically an obligation to outside investors. And that means that it may come at the detriment of other stakeholders like your clients, your employees, the community you operate in. So, it's true. I personally, when I see a fellow entrepreneur raise capital, I never say congratulations. I said, well done. Good luck. I wish them well, but that means now the stakes are higher. They got a bullseye on their back and there's a ticking time bomb because investors have a lot of investments. You're just one of them. They have a fiduciary duty to give that capital back with a return to their, to their limited partners. So I do think it's not wise. I think you want to focus on things like sustainability, the same way we want companies to have a sustainable outlook. Like, hey, if you made a billion dollars in profit, but those water bottles cost the environment $2 billion, your net profit is really negative a billion if you think about it. But we don't think like that in, in society. And so I think you do want to think on sustainability. You do want to think on profitability. But because this entire generation has seen Silicon Valley, venture capital, the allure of it, it's a drug, they're being conditioned that way. I think eventually there will be a regression to the mean and it's because probably this whole generation of entrepreneurs has not gone through a correction. Going back to 2007 and eight, the Lehman crash and before that, the 2000 NASDAQ and dot com crash. If you're an entrepreneur who's 20 years old, that's all ancient history. I might as well tell, take them, tell them about polio. So I think the next time there's a correction, the entrepreneurs are going to kind of have that rude awakening and there's always a correction. And uh, then they will come to appreciate that there's no free lunch and that uh, maybe they shouldn't lean on other people's money as much, but you know, to each their own. Right. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I got another question here from Ash Ken. <laughs> Uh, he says, thank you, Ash. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, someone shares your name. Thank you, Ash Ken. This is a question um, from Ash Ken Keon from IEMS group limited in Waterloo. When you're trying hard to get investments and have serious monthly cash flow problems to keep your team going and create great products, you are under a lot of stress because you are in charge as a CEO, then what would you do in the short term and the midterm? 
So that's been, well, we not only share the same name, Ashkan, but uh, when I was in uh, 2006, we ran out of money in 2007. So all my RSPs, like my 401ks, my cash, my everything, just poof, gone. And then I, because I thought this was normal, I even mortgaged my place to keep the company afloat, to not let people go. And I was, I didn't sleep ever well because I was always struggling and concerned with payroll two weeks out. But long story short, for me, I did have good perspective. I don't think you could succeed if your spouse does not support you as an entrepreneur. So I was very lucky that my spouse was super supportive. She was with me. Although after a few years, I was like, this may be too much. Let's go have a child just to kind of give you a bit of a breather because it was a bit intense. And we wanted to have kids, obviously. Um, and then she came back and not a coincidence that that's when the company took off in a positive light. But like I had soccer, you know, frankly, when I started off, it allowed me a bit of balance because I could go and not think about payroll. And, and then what I liked about soccer when the company became successful was that I was just one of the guys. I wasn't CEO Ash. I was an investor Ash. You just put on the jersey. You're all the same. Um, but to answer your question, I think you have to just be realistic with like, what is your runway? You know, I got to a point where I had that come to Jesus moment in Madison Square Park or when my credit card got turned down for an $18 grocery bill. But when I was in Madison Square Park, I said, Ash, you think you focus by focusing on video, but if you're gonna succeed, you need to focus on something, pop culture, health, beauty. Um, so if you are struggling with cash flow, but the, the fundamentals are improving, then it's a question of persistence. If you are, however, in this never ending, and that's up to you what never ending means because success is relative, subjective and fluid. But if you're like in this never ending hamster wheel, you just have to be realistic and you have to write down what are the lines at which point you're gonna make some tough changes. Selling, shutting down, letting people go, bringing in a partner, accepting maybe outside capital under terms that you didn't really want, right? So at a high level, try to have balance in your life, whether it's cooking or sports or some kind of activity that gives you a bit of a breather. Two, if it's really um, lay down the parameters of what is your real threshold? At what point are you like enough is enough? And then three, I would just say it boils down to, yeah, is it kind of like, are the fundamentals getting better and you kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel? Or is that light at the end of the tunnel, just another oncoming train and you're in denial? All right. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I agree with that. I, I, I think one thing as well that you said that really resonated with me was how you leaned a lot on soccer and other sort of extracurricular things to, um, to, to sort of distract you and provide a release. And I was just wondering if you found something that I've kind of noticed throughout uh, my life as well is that sometimes the more stressed you are with work, sometimes the better you'll play in soccer or hockey or, or whatever. It's when you show up to the feet, to the pitch or to the rink or whatever, and you're just super stressed out about something that happened at work or school or in your family life. And that's almost those, the, the games that, that you play even better, which I, I find I is was, always just amazing. I was uh, like, when I would play, I would literally score three goals a game, which is not normal in a soccer match, even playing like that's indoor. Like then let's say futsal would, I, my first year playing full pitch, I was scoring like two goals per game. It was just, it was not a coincidence because I had all this pent up energy, all this yeah. pent up frustration. I would just kind of go crazy. When I got hurt, my, my first reaction was what, what took so long. I play clean, don't cheat, called even my own fouls, but, but I was very intense because for me it was stress management, anger management. Again, I'm not playing soccer yesterday. I yelled at a chicken for burning it. You know what I mean? Like, so yes, it's, it's totally inversely correlated. Um, yeah, definitely makes sense. Could you tell I'm going to miss soccer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> for sure. Um, that looks like that's just about it. If anybody has any last minute questions, get them in now. Um, yeah, no, there's Ashkan's answer. Yeah, no, you, you definitely yeah. a supportive and, and lovely wife and uh, volleyball and ride bicycle. Yeah, I may be looking at a stationary bike and, and, and swimming for the next little while. There you All go. Right. Awesome. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, let's uh, let's see some more, a couple more clapping emojis for Ashkan as we send them off. Um, Ash, uh, from everybody here at Cascana Vope, just want to thank you. That was a great.
great speech, great presentation. Thank awesome. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time, guys. Take care. Good luck. And if you uh, ever need something, I'm not hard to find. If I could help anybody, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Okay. Thanks very much. Take care.